rather than just letting you all sit here and uh, look at me while we're waiting to move on to the slides, I'll give you a quick overview of, of Glen and Capital and where we've been and, and what I've done. So I set this business up in 2008 and it was interesting listening to the introduction. There hasn't been a lot of micro cap um, players out there. We think it's an exciting part of the market. We've been there a long time. There hasn't been a lot of um, institutional interest. There is a little bit, but the guys that seem to specialize in that generally tend to do well because it's not the poor child. It doesn't generate a lot of revenue for a BT or an AMP or a really big business. Fantastic. Okay. All right, now you've all read our disclaimer. Um, but I've had a long history in micro caps. There's a few faces here that are very familiar. They've been doing a long time as well. So it's good to see events like this generating a bit of interest for the sector. Um, what we look for, we were asked to talk about what we look for in a micro cap company. It's after a long time, there's some things you start to think that are quite important to look for. Um, this is the pie chart of, of what we think is important. The most in the single thing that we look for when we're investing in this sector is the quality of the management. You know, a small business is just a group of people. The management don't have a huge track record of success. There are some people that come back to market and have done things before. We like backing some of those people because we've made money from them before. Um, but we also like them to have a bit of skin in the, in the game. So, you know, the nice thing about small and micro cap companies is there are some entrepreneurial people. Australia and New Zealand are full of companies where you've got uh, entrepreneurs that want to grow their business, they come to the market to raise money. There's many, many uh, micro cap companies out there and the good ones, the Australian stock market is a great place to list and access capital. So looking at management, we don't invest in anything at all that we haven't met the management on. It's quite important to us. Um, whether we meet them in person or we have a conference call with them, we make sure we talk to them um, before we invest. So that's one of the key things we look for. The other thing that's important to us is that the business has to have some growth prospects. So the industry might not be growing, but it might be able to, for example, be a small telco that's taking market share off something like a Telstra or something like that. So they can grow their market share within an industry when the big companies can't really compete because they have such a large market share. It happens in the finance sector, it happens in telcos, and there's a lot of sectors uh, in the Australian economy because we do tend towards duopolies and monopolies in Australia. And the other thing we like to see is if they're not growing their market, that's a company that's got the ability to either grow um, their margins or have some type of pricing power so that they're not constantly putting their prices down. So that's one of the other things that we look for when we're making investment. You don't want to be investing into a business that over time has to continually reinvent itself because it's getting margin erosion because there's so much competition in the industry. The other thing we like to see is uh, sustainable businesses. So we don't like... Um, businesses that we don't think are going to be around in a few years and it's not really a business but the thing that always comes to mind is you know a few years ago all the AFL players out there were wearing the power balance band something that absolutely did nothing but that company sold 50 million dollars worth of those things so you know and it doesn't exist now it was a fad so we like a business that we think is going to be around for three four or five years the thing with micro caps is you need to give the business models time to um, really evolve so it can take you know, several years for plans to you know, eventuate and management's execution of that to come to fruition. And the thing with um, micro caps, though, it can be quite a binary decision. So it's either one or zero. The business is going to do well or stay a marginal business forever or it'll go broke. So as long as they keep um, hitting those goals, you need to continually monitor that and make sure that the competitive environment hasn't changed. And again, here, the other thing we look for um, in terms of being a sustainable business is that it has got pricing power. You don't want to be in an industry where you just got to continually put your price down. So, and, and on that point, we will invest in loss-making businesses where we can see um, that there's a fixed cost base and eventually the revenue will go and they'll get fixed cost base coverage and then you'll start to get quite good returns from your investment. The other thing we like is barrier entry. Um, you need to make sure that not everyone can go and set up a business, enter into the market and compete with you. And so there's been a lot of industries over time where you, know, you just can't maintain your margin because there are absolutely no barriers to entry. Um, so we like, whether it's a legislative um, barrier, like a, you know, investing in a stock market like the ASX or um, something where it's got regulated barriers, or whether it's a very high technological barrier to entry or something like that. It needs to have something that means that the company continue to operate in that market and not everyone with capital like private equity can come in, enter into the market and disrupt the marketplace. 
And the final thing, which I guess is most important, we have to see the businesses undervalued. So there's a range of metrics that we use to do that. We don't just simply say, oh, look, we're buying businesses on a P of four, five, six, seven times. We might do a sum of the parts uh, valuation. We might do a, um, a DCF valuation. And we might buy a business, like I said, with that fixed cost coverage where it might be trading on a P of 50 or 60 times. But we can see over the next two or three years time that really it's trading on three or four times. And the way I like to think about all of the businesses we buy, if I had to just make one investment and that was the only company that I could own, the market was a liquid, would I be happy owning that investment? And so with all of our portfolio, we own some businesses I'd say are not great businesses, but we haven't paid a lot for them. And I make the example of um, you know, a coal company. Look, we're more than happy to own resource stocks if we think they're cheap, but I think about it from a payback period of time. You know, if I put $100 million into, and it was my only investment into a coal company, I want to make sure that I'm going to get enough cash out of that business over the next three, four or five years to own that business. So that means I can only really buy something on a PE of five, six or seven times what I think the earnings are going to be. So that's the way we think about it. We like to make sure that we're going to get cash out of a business. Whether that's returned as dividends or not is not as important to us because many of the small companies are desperate for capital and they're continually raising capital. So and that's a great situation because the return on equity for most of those businesses is higher than what we'd achieve if we took the cash out in the form of a 5% or 6% dividend. So how do we go about and find the companies? This is the process that we go through. So we come, we've got a few different method, methods we come up with to generate ideas. We've got about 500 companies that we run through um, some various different filters. And each week we sit down and we create a research agenda. We go out, see the companies. We do a lot of background work before we go and see the companies. I've sat in a lot of group meetings in the industry where um, you know, people will sit in, in with management and say, look, what do you guys actually do? And, my sort of thoughts on that is, one, it's a waste of management's time because they're busy. And secondly, you really need to know what you're buying before you go out and see the meeting. It doesn't take that long to do a little bit of homework and say, look, it's a bit like if you want to go and buy a Commodore and you're going out and you're looking at Ferraris, you can't afford it and you're not going to buy it. So you're wasting everyone's time going and having a look for it. You need to know what the market cap is. You know, have a rough idea of the business model, have a look at the financials and understand you know, what the drivers are in the business before you actually go out and see the company. We do spend a lot of time going and meeting with management. If, the, if we think there's some merits and it creates, it ticks some of those boxes we talk about in terms of, you know, we think the management's good, we like the industry, we like the pricing power, we will go and do a detailed valuation on the business. And then for that company to get into our um, portfolio, we have to do, um, it has to get in on its relative um, merits. We don't run a lot of positions in the portfolio. There's 32 positions in the portfolio now so there's a lot of guys running a lot less now. I think over the 25 years I've been doing small caps, I think it's about the right number. You don't want to have, there's a lot more risk in having a small and micro cap portfolio than there is in having a big cap portfolio. Things can go wrong. We've seen a lot of times where there's an X factor, something will come out of the blue and it'll affect the investment and it you know, can halve in value. So there's a lot more volatility. You need to spread that risk. The largest position we've got in the portfolio is about 8% of the portfolio. And we don't really let things get to more than 10% of the portfolio. And that means we've got to work a bit harder. It's not like your personal portfolio where you can you know, put half of your funds into one stock, it does well and um, you've made a lot of money. We're trying to generate long-term sustainable returns, which means we've got to find more investments, continually cycle through them and review them quite frequently, and make sure they still warrant being in the portfolio. Um, things that we do tend to look for in, in, the, um, in the small cap market, and I'll just put a bit of a, um, a caveat on like talking about the definition between um, small and micro caps. Well, I had a, someone that researches that fund the other day saying, look, you've breached your mandate, you've got 30% of your portfolio in micro caps. And I said, really? I thought it was 10 because we say we have about 10. And the idea is that we have 10 1% positions and as those businesses grow, um, we'll give them more capital and they're, they're less of a micro cap and they're more of a big cap. But apparently this guy told me that the market defines micro caps as companies under 150 mil. We're obviously really looking at a way smaller end than that because we think it's a micro cap if it's about under 100 mil. Um, and then we don't think, it depends on the business because if I bought a company with a $20 million market cap and it went to $60 million, it's a lot bigger than what it was when I invested in it. So I don't think of that as a micro cap. Depends on the, the level of maturity of the business model, level of maturity of the business, the, you know, the spread of clients and how far it's evolved since we made our original investment decision. So that's how we tend to think about what's in, um, in the portfolio. 
So the first thing we, we like, and you know, I hear a lot of people who are very cautious about this, but it is roll up and roll out. So either something's rolling out stores or it's making acquisitions. So if we move um, onto that, in terms of roll ups that we have in our portfolio, we own Think Childcare. Um, you know, it, it's growing a portfolio of childcare businesses. We like the business. It hasn't done a lot in the last year, but they had a consolidation year. And if you thought about that business as if you owned the business, you know, if you grew quite quickly, you would need a period of, you can't keep perpetually growing. You need to sell the business down, put a bit of infrastructure and things in place like that. And it's a similar situation for um, the largest position in the portfolio, which is National Vet Care. Um, it's got about 3% share uh, in the veterinary practice market. The largest is Green Cross. We did very well at Green Cross a few years ago. So it's a similar theme in the management from National Vet Care, and which is you know, one of the key things we look at. They're ex-Green Cross, so they know what they're doing. It gave us a lot of confidence in the business. As I said, it's our largest position. We bought it at a dollar in the IPO. And I think it's about $2.60 or $2.70 now. And on that theme, Paragon Healthcare is another interesting roll-up business that we've got that's making acquisitions of businesses that supply things like um, hospital beds and trolleys and things to uh, the healthcare industry and hospitals. So there's some of the roll-ups that we've got in the portfolio. It is a little bit like musical chairs with these things. You have to watch them very closely, make sure um, there is a time when you want to get out of these businesses because there might not be a lot of organic growth in, growth in the underlying business that they own. And the example I make is uh, National Vet Care. They do a great job of buying, arbitraging that you know, private business to public um, multiple. But you don't really just want to own a single veterinary practice. They're geographically constrained. You can only pull clients from a geographic region. There's, they only grow at the rate of GDP. So it's very hard to, um, if you own that business singularly, to actually make a lot of money for it. So you only want to be owning these businesses while they're continuing to get that arbitrage from being a private business to a public business and they're making acquisitions. So they're not long-term investments. And when I say long term, you know, we've had them for a couple of years, but I'm talking about owning for 10 or 15 years. You want to make sure you're just there while they're getting incremental growth. And they get, do get to a point in time where they're so large that each acquisition they make is negligible to the actual um, profit. You know, it, it's just so small in the scheme of things. So that's how we think about the roll ups, but you can sit there for three, four, five years and make a good return while they're still growing. Uh, the other thing is disruption. We like that as a, as a theme in the economy. It's something that we look for. And, and that's you know a long-term theme, I think, in small and micro-cap uh, businesses. You get people that are very entrepreneurial. They come up with a business idea. They come to the market to raise capital. And they really change the way the existing market's operating. So one of those businesses, some of you might be familiar with, is Zip Money. Companies like that, Afterpay is another one. We never invest in, in Afterpay because um, we had a big shareholding in Zip Money. But... These guys have been able to come into, so Zip Money provides um, a small credit. So if you go to Freedom Furniture, for example, and you want to buy a lounge, historically you used to have to get a loan from GE. You'd sit there with your wife and you'd wait you know, half an hour for GE to you know, get the facts with all of your financials on. They'd make a credit assessment. Zip Money's got a technology solution. The retailers like it because that whole credit approval process is about five minutes now. So you're entering your details, the approval comes back in five minutes. And the biggest risk to the retailer is that you were sitting there before that, you know, and waiting half an hour and all of a sudden you think, look, I'm not really sure we want the lounge or should we spend this money? And so, you know, you get a bit of buyer remorse and they're there and they haven't committed so they can walk away. So it's good for retailers. Um, it's a good technology solution. The business is growing. You've got entrepreneurial people in the business. So it's a business that we like. We do do a little bit of unlisted investments as well, which is really at the very micro sort of end in things. Uh, Titomic just listed, it's a business we have in the portfolio. Uh, Titomic's got great technology um, that's got sort of world-class applications in terms of welding titanium. Um, but the way, the, it's very hard to weld titanium. These guys actually sort of fuse it together in a, in a sort of scientific process that means that they can create weldless joints. So it's a lot stronger. There's applications all around the world. People talk about the uses of carbon fiber, but titanium's got very good um, uses in a lot of different industries. They're already commercially producing bike frames. Um, so that was a business that we thought, you know, had great opportunities on a global scale. And one of the other listed investments that we've got is, is Local Agent Finder. Um, which is a comparison website, you know, and we talk about management. It's got Matt McCann, who used to run iSelect, um, which is a very similar type business running it. Um, it's disrupting an industry. You know, I, how we came onto this investments, I woke up one day and I have to be cautious of the time because I like talking about this stuff. But, um, you know, local agent, I woke up one day and I thought, oh, I want to sell my, my apartment in the city. And I thought, but I have to ring a real estate agent. That's all just too hard. I don't want to do it. And I thought, there's got to be a way where I can wake up in the morning, I can press a button. 
I can load my place up and go take some photos and load my place up. I can get a contract electronically. And we thought about that and we started to do a lot of research on the market. And there's a listed company called Buy My Place that does that. But I don't think people change their um, purchasing habits that quickly. You're not going to sell your largest asset in life through um, an online portal now. I think people will get to that, but I think it'll take a while. So local agent fund actually allows you to compare rates and different things that real estate agents charge. It is disrupting the industry, and I think there'll be various iterations before we get to that stage where people do sell um, you know, completely digitally. They do it themselves. You click a button if you don't want to take the photos, a photographer will be sent out, and, and Buy My Place is working that way. But you are seeing the whole real estate industry changing. It's, it's happened in stockbroking where commissions have gone from fixed rates of either dollar values or, or you know, 2% many years ago down to, you know, I think someone was telling me to do an international trade the other day for you know, $15. So things are coming down. And, and real estate is one of the last industries where you know, the commissions haven't been charged that too much. It's pretty much standard you know, in major cities that you charge 2%. Now you can compare those rates. You, you know, rates will come down. You've got purple bricks entering the market. The Buy My Place guys are doing it um, cheap. And there's a couple of other comparison websites. So that's one of the things, um, disruption. It may or may not work. As it's an unlisted business for us, but I definitely think there'll be disruption in that, that industry. Uh, the next thing we like is, is owner operators. So it's a big thing. It's probably our best investments over the last 10 years have been companies where there's a large single shareholder and they make the right decisions for the business. Um, so these are some of the companies in the portfolio where you've got uh, key executives with the founders of the business. They're there. They make the right decisions for long term. And so many times we see larger companies where the executives have come in, they take huge amounts of equity in the business through performance rights, huge salaries. They're gone three years later and the business is in no better um, situation. So um, generally you find these people don't make stupid decisions. They make long-term strategic uh, decisions about the business. You know, and they, they're very motivated to not pay themselves through salaries, but to make sure you get share price um, appreciation. So um, these are all interesting businesses. Indy Singh you know, runs Fiducian. We've been a shareholder for a long time. He's done very well. He's got a good, stable business in financial services. Skydive the Beach is another um, uh, interesting business that we've got that's making acquisitions. Uh, it's growing that sort of adventure tourism market. And, and Apollo Tourism you know, runs... Um, Imports Winnebago, but they also operate in Canada and the US, and they're growing rapidly. And you know, it's got a family behind the business that you know is a major shareholder. Um, we've got some deep value things, and there's a couple of fund managers I see here are going to cringe at some of these things. But look, we think there's value in them. PMP, the printing industry, perennially been um, you know having price pressure. We've met all of the competitors. Um, they all say that they're going to do the right things. Um, you're not paying a lot for the business. And you know, Shine Lawyers, you know, it's just had a class action announced against them. Shares are trading at sixty-two cents. It's significantly less than where it was trading a few years ago. But the cash flow coming into the business is very strong. So it's one of the things we like um, about the business. And if you don't take risks like these in the, your portfolio, you're not really going to get sort of great returns. And we think both these businesses will do very well over the next couple of years. Um, and the last thing is, is you know, the very small and micro cap end of the market. So we own a business called um, CML Group. I think I saw the guys here. Uh, earlier. Uh, Drop Suite's another business we've got which has done a deal. Um, Drop Suite, if you're a small small business, very few small businesses have sufficient um, IT and I think you know our business is a small business, I think we've got sufficient um, IT but you know our website was hacked this time last year. You know put a heap of links to different sites in Spain in there. Drop Suite actually allows you to back your website up, back up your email so it gives a range of um, business solutions to small small businesses. They distribute through Google. Um, they've got a couple of other large, um, uh, not Google, through GoDaddy, which is one of the largest you know, sellers of domain names in the world. So they're doing good deals. Uh, it's good software and you're entrenched. So I like that, you know, both the GoDaddy makes money out of it, but once you're there, people sort of forget that it's there. You continue backing up your website. You feel safe that it's there. And maybe once a year you'll have to um, restore your website or restore your emails and it's a nice bit of security to have. So I think that whole small business um, IT and security level will increase and it doesn't cost you a lot. It only costs you a couple of dollars a month, but you multiply that by the number of domain names and small businesses that are out there. It's an attractive um, opportunity set for drop suite. Um, and as I mentioned, CML Group, you know, it's a great small business. It's got a major shareholder. The guys know what we're doing. We've been looking at the business for five years. Um, what changed for us to make the decision is they got some bank debt, but it does... Um, receivables financing. So if you have a small business um, and you're having cash flow issues, 
you know, they'll, they'll forward you the cash from your receivables, they do a deal with your clients to make sure you get paid. They make a lot of smaller fees along the way, you know, establishment fees, so it's good margin. There's no risk if the client goes broke because they're getting paid directly by your client where you provided the goods and services for. So uh, it's, a, it's a good business. These are all at the micro cap end of the market. Um, and Crowd Mobile is another small business that we own that's um, developing communities. So you charge people for providing content. You know, you might only get a cent for a text message or sending a question or something like that. So um, it's another good business. Um, you know, we've invested with the guy that runs the business before and made good money out of it. Um, so look, if you want more information, you can download this from our website. The other thing that we do is we try to be very open with all the shareholders in our listed vehicle. Um, we do a newsletter and a video every week um, because I take the view that if you're invested in our listed vehicle, we're business partners. You know, if you want to call me or get some information, we're very open and transparent because we all have shares. I'm a large shareholder in our listed vehicle as well. I'm the largest individual in it. So if our shares don't go up, I don't get, um, you know, my money goes backwards. So that gives us quite good alignment as well. I'm pretty sure that you know, a lot of the big fund managers at AMP and that don't actually have any money in their own strategies. We believe in what we do and we back ourselves. So thanks for that.